Best advice you've ever received? Be yourself. Yeah. Superpower you'd like to have? Uh, the ability to love without judgment at all times. All I can do is prepare my craft to be diligent and focused enough for when I connect and when a wave of divinity flows through me that I have the muscles, the craft, to express it and to articulate it into some kind of something. Michael Peter Balseri, better known as Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, is regarded as one of the greatest bass players of all time. As a founding member of the band, Flea was instrumental to its formation and success. In the 10th grade, Flea met Anthony Kiedis, who he later formed the Red Hot Chili Peppers with. Their friendship continues to last now and is decorated with many successes and accomplishments. Six Grammy Awards, 16 nominations, an induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. But let's take it back to Flea's initial encounter with Akitas, the bond that sparked it all. I met him when I was 15. We had both just started the 10th grade at Fairfax High School in Hollywood. And we were like almost immediately like in love and at war. You know what I mean? It's like this. Has it stayed that way ever since? And it's stayed that way ever since. And the thing that I try to express about our relationship, you know, and I write about my childhood and he's a huge part of my childhood and became my family. I mean, we were inseparable yeah. for many years, like especially when we were young, it was like every single day we were together. From the, the thing that I try to express about it in my book is that from the very beginning, I remember my mom, you know, rest in peace, who told me uh, a few years before she died, she said, you know, I remember when you came home, you were 15. That is hard, because I get... Um, she said to me, She's like, Michael, you came home and you were all lit up. And you said, you said, Mom, Mom, I finally found someone I can talk to. And um, I really did, yeah. you know. And, um, you know, like any really close brotherly relationship, it's, you know, yeah. we go at each other too. But I was there. I found someone I could communicate with in a, in a way and in a profound way that I hadn't had before. I knew that it was big and I felt forces beyond me, like bringing us together. Um, I had no idea about a professional life or anything like that and I still sometimes I often feel that like you know the longevity of our band and everything it's not you know I know our band's been successful and all that but it's not so much the band itself mm -hmm. that does it and all the professional obligations and stuff and you know our desire to try to continue to be a, in a, a, rel a, a evolving artistic and entity mm -hmm. but but like our band is a vehicle it's like the universe has decided, well, here's this thing that'll keep them together, so just do that. Anthony Kiedis wasn't Flea's only friend that he accomplished amazing things with. In 2001, Flea founded the Silver Lake Conservatory of Music with Keith Tree Barry, a former touring member. The Silver Lake Conservatory of Music is a non-profit music school. I started... Based on Silver Lake. Yeah, it's in Silver Lake, right on Sunset and Sanborn. I started it 13 years ago. Uh, we have 700 music students in there. Um, we teach all the orchestral instruments, all the band instruments. And, um, you know, when I was a kid, I was kind of a rough kid. I was on the street, I was getting in trouble, I was doing petty crimes, I was on drugs. Um, the one thing that really kind of kept me focused was the music programs in the public schools that I went to. It gave me a sense of self, it gave me a discipline, it gave me something to work on. And, um, you know, after I graduated high school in 1980, Reaganomics, they passed Proposition 13, and it really the, cut out the arts funding in Los Angeles Terrible. public schools. Terrible, and it's never recovered from it. And um, I went back uh, about 15 years ago to Fairfax High School to talk to the music students there about a career in music. And I was just shocked when I walked in there. They had no instruments, they had no orchestra, they had a volunteer teacher, a boombox, they listened to music and talk about it. When I was there, I played in a big orchestra, I could play any instrument I wanted, it was incredible. So I really vowed to myself to do something to try to fill the void in, in music education. Because I know there are a lot of kids like me that it would change their lives. It's just been an absolutely transcendently incredible experience having this school, Larry. It's been seeing these kids, so many of these kids, it means so much to them. And seeing especially the ones that are really earnest and really care about it, uh, it's just great to see them blossom and grow. Other people in the band work at the school? Ever? Um, no, no, we do. You know, some have, like we do performances for the kids and fundraisers and stuff. It's just been, um, just, just a little bit about the school. The school is not about being famous. It's not about being an entertainer. It's about, it's a really academic school, 
a, a processed based thing. It's about, it's not even about music education as the means to an end. It's just about the educational process itself and teaching kids to, you know, enrich their lives with music. Why, whenever they make budget cuts in education, arts yeah. go first? I don't know. It's really, it's terrible. You know, I mean, for us, we think about it as, you know, the three A's instead of the three R's in arts, academics, and athletics all being of equal importance and they should all be given equal attention in school. And he's continued to hold arts and athletics near and dear to his heart. Given his amazing stage presence, it's no surprise he uses these tools to connect mind, spirit, and body, allowing him to remain in the present moment. When I'm in a healthy creative space, when I'm truly able to get gone in my creativity, um, whether the work that I'm doing is of a high quality or not, I become present, and when I'm present, um, I'm able to be there for other people. I mean, music and all forms of art as well, and I, you know, for me, athletics as well, like motion, yeah. you know, anything that makes you completely present in the fucking moment and alive with, with all, of, you know, mind, spirit, and body, everything there is, for me, it's always been a search for that. Like, that's why, I've, even when I had no idea what it was, even doing drugs, you know, yeah. that was the bliss that I was searching for was to be present. And it wasn't until I got older and stopped doing drugs and, you know, went through traumas that made me confront my childhood trauma that let me know that that's what I was searching for. I just didn't have to fucking shoot heroin in order to achieve it. There were other ways. As mentioned, Flea has had his battles with drug addiction. This resurfaced when, after years of hard work, the Chili Peppers finally bursted into stardom. The stark change of lifestyle took an intense toll on Flea's mental health. It took a well-respected friend's words of wisdom to get him through the hardest times of his life. I was about 30 years old in 1991, 92, 29 years old, just turning 30. And I became incredibly ill. I, and, and also, like, my band had just become this, you know, we had gone from years of, you know, sleeping on people's floors, touring in vans, doing all that. And all of a sudden, everything we wanted came. You know, all the money, all the validation, all the, you're so great. And I became so sick and it wouldn't go away. And for two years, I lost it. My immune system fell apart. I, everything that I thought made me great. Like I could rock out all night. I could take drugs, play basketball all day be the funniest guy, be the drunk guy, be the high guy, be the this guy, and I had nothing. And everything that I thought was me was gone, and it was completely traumatic. And it was like the universe forcing me to sit still and to deal with myself. Everything fell apart, I stopped, I canceled everything, I went home, and I, I was like in tears all the time. I was depressed, I was miserable. And it, I was like that for about a year, over a year. I started like going to doctors and trying this and meditating and you know what I mean? Like help Mr. Wizard, you know? And I knew I can't do drugs anymore, I can't. I stopped everything. But it wasn't until and there was someone, like a woman I really respected told me, she was like, how you doing? I said, I'm just fucking miserable. I'm so sad every day. And she said, well, Flea, until you get on your knees, and be grateful for exactly where you are. It's not gonna change. And that's what I did. <laughs> Devastatingly humbling, you know, but it literally, it's like at that moment, everything shifted in my life. It was a watershed moment. Since then, he's exploded back into the music scene, creating numerous musical masterpieces. From Give It Away to Under the Bridge, there's something we can all enjoy. Flea is so talented and well-practiced that his playing often seems effortless. Even so, he speaks of creative frustrations that he still struggles with in the present day. In every creative endeavor I do in a state of fear, in a state of not being good enough, in a state of yearning and reaching for trying to fulfill the feeling of, the, of what I want, of what I want to connect with. You know, I mean, I have my moments. I have my moments when I'm gone, like when I'm playing live and I'm absolutely gone and I know that I, 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 where was that hour? Well, I was just a channel, you know? You know, you hear like great actors talk about acting. They're always looking to get lost, get in the moment, to be gone, to let their true self out, even when they're being someone else. I have moments of like 
I, I get anxiety a lot when recording because I'm always looking, I'm yearning so much to get in this like lost and beyond thought and gone and just feeling like I'm just light is coming through me, you know? And when I can't get there, and I know I'm sitting here thinking about it, thinking about, well, maybe my wife would dance if I played this. So this has got to be good because her and all her girlfriends would dance. But even then I'm mad at myself because I'm thinking. Yeah. And like even it was a moment of levity and I actually kind of got into a good rhythm for a minute. I'm like, fuck, I'm thinking. And then I start having a panic attack because I'm not supposed to be thinking, I'm supposed to be gone. So I have that struggle. But Rick gave me an analogy once, Rick Rubin, uh, uh, about similar to ditch digging. He's like, it's like flea, you're going fishing. You know, you're not, you can't get the magic groove every time. You, you cast your thing, you're diligent, you stay there, you're always fishing. And sometimes you catch, you know, the magic behemoth you know, Beowulf comes, rears his head from the depth and, you know, everything happens. And yeah. sometimes you sit there and get a sunburn, you know, and that, that was a like, kind of a similar analogy for me. And I think it's safe to say, when he is able to clear his mind of thought, there truly is something magical expressed. But what does Flea want his audience to take away from this expression? All I want, I want the work to be a vehicle for connection to bring people together to create love and create empathy. Um, and for people to just trip out and get lost and have joy and to identify it. Well, I guess, well, let me simplify this. I want the, the, any art I make to serve the purpose of making people feel less alone. Um, that's the whole thing. Mm -hmm.